chapter seventeen of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter seventeen the beginning of trouble as time went on the relations between captain gaythorne and his beautiful wife grew more and more strained her contempt for him was more openly showed and his unhappiness at her indifference more fully displayed every day they spent together of course no wife is justified in behaving to her husband as fabia was behaving then but still it cannot be denied that poor charlie managed her very badly fabia was the type of woman who wanted to find her master and charlie persisted in fawning at her feet as if he were her slave or her spaniel and yet he was a manly enough man where his own sex was concerned his men had always obeyed him and his fellow-officers respected him from the time that he first entered the service but as a boy he had been trained to be afraid of his mother and consequently as a man he was afraid of his wife he would do anything compatible with reason and honour to avoid the storms of feminine temper and yet or perhaps therefore the lightnings of female wrath were forever hurtling round his devoted head it never answers to kowtow to a subject race it always renders that race exacting and overbearing it is man's place to rule and the minute that he lays down his sceptre woman snatches it up and hits him over the head with it as he richly deserves women invariably bully the men who are afraid of them be they husbands or brothers or sons and the more a man cringes before them the less consideration they show him the true man will always regard his wife as a queen and treat her with all homage and reverence as such but he will know in his heart that she is really only a queen consort though on that score entitled to all the more chivalry and consideration in the smaller things of life he will render to her every courtesy it will be his to fetch and carry hers to order and command because he rules in the greater things he will always submit to her wishes in the lesser because the crown is really his he will always allow her the full prerogative of the coronet the man who domineers over his wife in trifles is as unworthy of his kingship as is the man who trembles before her with regard to the weightier matters of the law for the very fact that he is by right her lord and master should make him all the more eager never publicly to display himself as such or to lower his royal dignity by dragging it in the dust of petty domestic affairs a crown is not the fitting headgear for the daily walk abroad or the peaceful evening at home a sceptre is not the suitable implement for the stirring of teacups or the making of puddings there is nothing which so cheapens and vulgarizes an article as over advertisement there are some things so delicately made that to talk about them destroys them there is truth as well as beauty in the legend of the bride who lost her fairy lover as soon as she asked him his name as he told it to her he vanished the man who tells us that he is great thereby proves his own littleness the woman who announces that she is a lady thereby forfeits her right to the title have we not all in our time come across some of these members of the great army of snobs who show their lack of social position by their constant insistence on the same and who prove the ordinary and commonplace tint of their blood by their incessant testimony as to its azure hue in the same way the man who tyrannizes over his wife in trifles and is always eager to prove himself the master of the house shows that in reality he is nothing but a pretender and is no ruler by divine right 
for such divinity doth hedge a king who is in any sense a real king that he cannot stoop to haggle and squabble and nag his patent of royalty is too obvious to need any announcement his rank too inherent to require any herald to proclaim his style and this rule obtains in every other department of life good wine of any kind needs no bush the really well-bred person does not boast of his good breeding the really beautiful woman does not trouble to explain her charms the moment that a thing requires bolstering up by advertisement and explanation that thing begins to be a sham and a humbug and had better be thrown overboard altogether for in its very nature it is doomed to perish it was a great pity for her sake as well as his own that captain gaythorne did not better understand how to manage his young wife for her present attitude towards her husband was the worst thing possible for a woman of fabia's temperament she was bound sooner or later to get into mischief of some sort or another since matrimony if not an absorbing profession is a very unsatisfactory pastime fabia was a woman who needed occupation and interest in her life and if she could not get them from one source she would get them from another after gabriel so signally failed her all along the line she fell back upon her old friend ram chandar mukharji and ram chandar was a clever man who knew how to make the most of his opportunities he answered her letters in full giving her in unstinted measure all the intellectual stimulus and sympathy in which her husband was so conspicuously lacking and he scrupulously refrained from writing a word which could by the freest translation be construed into anything approaching love-making he knew that fabia was as yet unprepared for the actual existence of a lover although she was quite ready to amuse herself with the shadow and spirit of the thing and he also knew that when once a married woman begins thus to amuse herself the appearance upon the scene of the actual lover is but a matter of time some commandments are broken suddenly or not at all but others demand a more gradual process of disintegration lest the breaker should be so shocked at the idea of the catastrophe that the commandment would never get broken at all whatever defects the devil may have otherwise he always shows himself an adept in his own particular line of business and he is unrivalled in his powers of manipulating that effective instrument known as the thin edge of the wedge it unfortunately happened that fabia was left very much to herself and her husband just then christmas was over and mrs gaythorne was plunged in a vortex of godly dissipation and holy mirth and was submerged in a whirlpool of public meetings which would gain in force and number all through the spring until they reached their very maelstrom at exeter hall in may therefore she spent a considerable portion of her time in london and when at home was far too much occupied by the stress of rampant philanthropy to have any leisure or attention to bestow upon her son's conjugal difficulties isabel seaton however saw pretty clearly how things were going but she was one of the rare women who have mastered the fine art of minding their own business and having possessed herself of so valuable and uncommon an accomplishment she was naturally prone to practise the same nine times out of ten nay rather ninety-nine times out of a hundred harm instead of good is wrought by the intermeddling of well-intentioned persons in affairs not their own probably far less evil is brought about in the world by really bad and unprincipled people than by conscientious and well-meaning ones who interfere with matters that do not concern them 
and women far more than men are offenders in this respect when a really good woman is seized with a strong outpouring of the missionary spirit the amount of mischief that she will effect in a short time is almost incredible she will come between sister and brother parent and child husband and wife she will estrange devoted lovers and separate very friends and all the time she will purr contentedly to herself with satisfaction over her successful efforts and will thank god on her knees every night for what she will euphoniously term opportunities of usefulness she will never have the ghost of an idea that she is one of satan's most approved emissaries for introducing discord and stirring up strife let the first of us who has never suffered from the well-meant interference of a conscientious woman say a word in her defence i trow her advocates will be few and far between therefore it was to be counted to isabel for righteousness that she never attempted to set matters straight between charlie and fabia she was a married woman herself so she knew the danger of meddling between husband and wife she was perhaps overbold as a matchmaker but she shrank from the awful responsibility of putting asunder by word or hint or innuendo those whom god had joined together a single woman would doubtless have rushed in where mrs paul seaton feared to tread but she had learnt wisdom in the only school where it is properly taught the school of experience so she held her peace there is a delightful story told and a true one too of a lady with a very naughty little boy who consulted a friend one with seven children of her own as to how she was to train this rebellious olive branch i'll tell you what to do replied the mother of seven go straight to the first old maid you meet she will teach you exactly how to deal successfully with the matter but it's no good coming to me because i know no more about it than you do now childish women are not more omniscient in the training of the young than are old maids in the management of husbands and by the term old maids i mean the regular old maid not the broad-minded large-hearted spinster whose singleness is her own fault and every man's misfortune but the petty provincial narrow-minded woman sneering at her more fortunate sister and poking her crooked fingers into everybody's pies who would be just as much an old maid had she been married and had a large family who would in truth have been just as much an old maid had she been a man in fact many old maids have been men and it has not made them any the less old maidish indeed rather more so and it is this typical old maid nature which is generally most strongly imbued with the missionary spirit perhaps there is no type of woman more utterly fascinating and delightful than the really charming single woman the woman who retains the fascination and freshness of girlhood after she has attained to the culture and wisdom of mature life the dew of the morning is still in her eyes even though she has watched the lengthening of the shadows the scent of the spring is still in her hair even though it be crowned with the garlands of autumn she has never been awakened by the cares and realities of marriage from the dreams of her girlhood her place is in the glades of the forest rather than in the market-place in the garden of spices rather than in the store closet consequently she has more sympathy with and understanding of the young than has the busy matron for she still stands upon the mountain-top and sees the promised land through the magic haze of distance as the young are standing and seeing this type of woman will never be obsessed by the missionary spirit for she will be too shy to rebuke too sensitive to interfere she will do good and not evil all the days of her life by the tenderness of her heart and by the purity of her soul and the children of countless of her contemporaries will rise up and call her blessed because she does not belong exclusively to one man she will have leisure to sympathize with many because no child calls her mother she will have a wealth of universal mother-love 
to lavish upon all but unfortunately the interfering style of old maid is by far the more common species and isabel seaton had known so much harm done in this fashion by persons not really evil-minded that she herself was perhaps inclined to err upon the other side and to keep silence even from good words when such words would have been helpful and salutary there is a distinct difference between unjustifiable interference and the necessary word of warning but it requires a very astute mathematician to know exactly where to draw the line between the two anyhow it came about that isabel seaton refrained from saying a word to charlie as to the danger of his wife's obvious indifference to him and of her determination if he failed to afford her sufficient amusement to seek the same elsewhere and she likewise refrained for the present from saying anything to fabia upon the subject either as she did not wish to be the confidante of mrs charles gaythorne's feelings towards her husband isabel was a woman of the world and she knew that there are no people so much disliked as the people who are made even though it be against their own wishes the recipients of confidences to which they are not entitled we hate for ever afterwards the persons to whom according to common parlance we have given ourselves away even though the libation may have been purely voluntary at the time and quite undesired upon their part therefore wise men and women do not receive confidence the giving of which they know will afterwards be regretted by the donors of course isabel might have spoken to charlie's mother upon the subject but she shrank from doing this partly because such a course savoured of the most unjustifiable kind of interference and partly because she loved popularity and there is nothing that renders any one so unpopular as the imparting of disagreeable information the lady constance hit upon a great truth when she exclaimed to the bearer of evil tidings this news hath made thee a most ugly man hideous indeed in the eyes of us all are the faces of those who come to us as prophets of evil and likewise lovely are the messengers who bring us the gospel of peace yet there are men and women who wish to be attractive and desire to gain the affection of their fellow-men who nevertheless do not hesitate indeed rather hasten to carry the ill news and the evil report to those whose good opinions they most covet every word they utter is either a reflection or a complaint every criticism they make is an unfavourable one it never occurs to them that the ugliness of the message which they bear is reflected in their own countenances otherwise they would surely hold their peace so charles and fabia drifted further and further apart and fabia clung more and more to the support and sympathy of ram chandar mukharjee this new agent that i've got is a fool and utter fool exclaimed charlie as his wife and he were sitting at luncheon one day mrs gaythorne being busily engaged in london and carrying on bloodless revolutions for the benefit of the whole human race then why did you engage him i thought an agent's duty was to supply the deficiencies of his employer not to emulate them of course darling i didn't know he was a fool when i engaged him otherwise i should have been a fool myself for doing so precisely still you might have done it nevertheless i have known you in wisdom part company before now i often wonder what fools were made for the irate squire grumbled on so do i but i should have imagined that you would have found that out before now charlie was hurt but he tried not to show it and fabia despised him all the more for being so thick-skinned so she imagined and not to feel the cut of her lash in the interests of peace he changed the subject another mistake on his part as then fabia despised him for being frightened and running away i wonder if poor old carr will ever turn up again he said a good many people are wondering that you are not by any means solitary in your speculations it is desperately rough on janet she looks wretchedly ill poor little thing 
you would hardly expect her to laugh and grow fat on such a catastrophe would you it was certainly uphill work talking to fabia but charlie bravely went on his patient dogged way trying his hardest to make himself pleasant which was the very last thing he should have endeavoured to do of course not old girl by jove no i should think it would knock any woman to pieces for her husband to chuck it all up and cut and run on his honeymoon not necessarily it would depend upon the husband answered fabia in a tone which implied that if only captain gaythorne had seen fit to cut and run on his honeymoon it would have been the most advantageous arrangement possible for all parties concerned but i really think the poor little thing was awfully gone on carr don't you know persisted charlie still intent upon his cowardly desire for peace at any price naturally those plain dowdy little women are always off their heads with gratitude to any man who will marry them and it is extremely bad for the man well no one would say you were the sort of woman to be grateful to any lucky beggar who was so fortunate as to marry you said charlie with a brave attempt to be jocular i am not the reply was sufficient to crush a bolder man than charles again he changed the subject i say fabia don't you think we ought to do something for that poor little woman to make things a bit easier for her especially now the mater is so busy and can't see after her charlie had inherited much of his mother's kindness of heart fabia looked up languidly what sort of a thing find her another husband do you mean oh fabia charlie was really shocked by jove no she isn't that sort you talk as if husbands were like footmen so that if one doesn't suit the situation you can dismiss him and get another that is how i regard them charlie was positively helpless but what about marriage vows and till death us do part and things of that kind i do not believe in them i say old girl you should just have heard my father's views about marriage and all that sort of thing he'd got most tremendous notions about the sanctity of it and everything in that line don't you know i cannot help that i never married your father charlie looked puzzled of course not you couldn't have done as he was married long before either you or i were born which was to his credit added fabia charlie was more shocked than ever i say darling i wish you wouldn't say such things i don't like it not like me to praise your father's moral character how very peculiar of you men generally like their immediate ancestors to be commended fabia's smile was distinctly impertinent but all the same she felt the faint glimmering of respect for a husband who had the courage to admit that there was anything about his wife that he did not like but the ill-starred charlie rapidly extinguished that faint glimmer not in that way my darling i'm sure the mater wouldn't approve of it so don't do it there's a good girl fabia shrugged her shoulders how could she respect a husband who was always bolstering up his marital authority by quotations from his female parent my point is continued the well-meaning blunderer that my father was a married man himself don't you know i never heard the faintest whisper to the contrary fabia don't be so stupid there's a good child what i mean is that being a married man himself he knew what he was talking about and the fact that he was married and married as he was makes his opinion upon the indissolubility of marriage all the more valuable and remarkable there i agree with you although in her way fabia had a sincere respect for her mother-in-law she could imagine that an eternity spent in that lady's society would not appear short he had most awfully fine notions about marriage about its being for better for worse and for richer for poorer and all that don't you know continued charlie he didn't know much about for poorer did he of course not how could he he and my mother both had very tidy fortunes as well as the gaythorne estates in vain poor charlie endeavoured to follow the intricate workings of his wife's mind then his opinions did not count for much after all it is when you come to for worse and for poorer that the shoe begins to pinch 
many married people can stand the strain of for better and for richer though that is no slight one at times i admit oh darling i don't know about that look at love in a cottage and all that sort of thing heaps of people are most awfully keen on it i never was in love and i never was in a cottage so i cannot form an opinion upon the advantages and disadvantages of either charlie's face went very red but he was too much wounded to lose his temper i wish you were in love fabia he said pleadingly his wife laughed lightly it might be rather unpleasant for you if i were but it is really very unselfish of you to put my pleasure before yours in this way i mean in love with me fabia laughed again what an idea it is quite gone out of fashion for a woman to be in love with her own husband of course a person like janet carr is but it is just part and parcel of her general dowdiness i thought you hated a dowdy woman so i do i detest the sight of them then there is nothing dowdier than to be in love with one's own husband it is on a par with a shawl and ringlets and a white camellia fastened by the brooch charlie looked as he felt very miserable he knew that his own views were right and his wife's wrong and he also knew that he was not clever enough to demonstrate either of these propositions so he took refuge in an illustration the safest recourse for all those not gifted in argument isabel seaton is not dowdy and she is in love with her own husband he said that is so but isabel is an exception to that as to every rule since her marriage fabia had learnt to appreciate mrs seaton as she had never appreciated her before a friendship between a married woman and a single one is rarely successful unless it dates from pre-matrimonial days the husband and the confidential friend are not often compatible ingredients yet she always fancies herself as being so commonplace and normal and natural and all that sort of thing don't you know of course she does that is where she shows herself so exceptional it is the commonplace people who think that no one ever felt as they feel or suffered as they suffer or loved as they love i used to be a bit like that myself at one time till i learnt from isabel how very commonplace it was when did you think that no one ever loved as you did asked charlie eagerly men are very like children in one respect they always get hold of the least important part of a toy or a conversation and fix all their attention upon that to the exclusion of the really characteristic and interesting portion of the business in hand fabia told her husband the truth she saw no reason for not doing so on the present occasion i never actually thought that nobody ever loved as i did but i used to think that nobody ever could love as i could till isabel and experience taught me what a fool i was isabel would be pretty mad if she heard you say that she was an exception fabia smiled would she she is very fond of calling herself normal and commonplace but i doubt if she would be equally pleased if her friends endorsed her statements well anyhow you can't deny that she is jolly smart taking her all round and that she is in love with her own husband repeated charlie sticking to his point i cannot and yet i wonder at it mr seaton always appears to me an extremely dull person he is the sort of chap that wouldn't care a rap how he appeared to you or anybody as long as his own wife liked him said charlie speaking true i know that is one reason why i dislike him men who are very much in love with their wives always bore me to extinction well i am very much in love with mine heaven knows and unlike isabel you are not an exception to the rule the arrow went home charlie got up from his chair and walked towards the door i say fabia you are a bit too hard on a poor devil who worships the very ground you walk on heaven knows i do all in my power to please you and make you happy and yet the more he does for you the more you seem to despise and hate a fellow what else can i do to make you care for me and treat me 
as a wife should and poor charlie like jesting pilot paused not for an answer but went out of the room banging the door after him in his futile misery while his wife decided within herself that unless some new interest of or occupation were brought into her life and at once she should die of ennui so she made haste to write to her cousin ram chandar End of chapter 17chapter eighteen of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter eighteen dr mukharji early in the spring a considerable sensation was created in the fashionable world by an oriental occultist who set up a sort of seance in a small flat in mount street a dr mukharji he told fortunes consulted crystals cured nervous disorders and generally comported himself after the manner of his kind with that passion for anything absolutely new and especially for anything new concerning the eternal verities which characterizes the denizens of london to-day as it characterized the denizens of athens long ago it became the mode to run after dr mukharji and to accept with faith and humility his additions to accepted dogma and his emendations of revealed truth in short dr mukharji became so much the fashion that he would have found no difficulty had he been that way inclined in starting a brand new religion and securing countless converts to the same but it happened that he was not that way inclined so he contented himself with teaching a sort of neo-buddhism pseudo-theosophy and embellishing it with certain embroideries from the occult of course it was women who ran after him not men men let it be admitted to their credit are more diffident in exchanging old lamps for new than women are they hesitate before giving up the word which has been a lantern unto their feet in favour of some new fad in electric lighting but women as a rule will recklessly barter away the seven golden candlesticks of the book of revelation for the patent lamp which some pioneer of modern thought has hung on the front of his bicycle therefore women crowded to the little flat in mount street and confided their respective pasts to dr mukharji on condition that he would in return confide to them their respective futures many silly women were led captive by the strange devices of the occultist but none attended his rooms in mount street with such frequency and regularity as fabia so much so that ere long scandal began to busy itself with the names of dr mukharji and mrs charles gaythorne and to hint very unpleasant things concerning that lady's repeated visits to the oriental quack and fortune-teller then at last isabel seaton broke through her rule and interfered i have got something rather horrid to say to you fabia she began i hate saying it and you'll hate hearing it but it has got to be said so here goes then why say it at all fabia interrupted her if neither you nor i will derive any pleasure from the communication why impart it because my conscience insists upon it and my conscience so rarely mentions anything or makes itself in any way troublesome that i hardly like to refuse it on the rare occasions when it does yours certainly is not an importunate conscience fabia admitted with her languid smile 
no it isn't its worst enemy couldn't call it a chatty sort of conscience for it hardly ever speaks from week's end to week's end i don't hear its voice therefore when it does begin to whisper i feel bound to listen to it as i certainly shouldn't do if it were one of those tiresome garrulous consciences which never give their owners a moment's peace you should just hear paul's the thing can't hold its tongue for five minutes together but is always poking its nose into matters that don't concern it i could imagine that mr seaton's conscience is the sort that might give trouble to its owner paul's wife sighed deeply i believe you and not to its owners only it is a typical specimen of the nonconformist conscience in full working order with all the latest improvements laid on the moment he gives it its head it begins grumbling and spluttering like an infuriated motor-car till his life and mine become burdens to us and the more we suffer the more that terrible conscience sets all its hideous machinery in motion unfortunately paul is such an unselfish husband that he shares everything with me even down to his conscientious scruples and they alas are so numerous and so active and isabel sighed again poor isabel but there was envy rather than pity in fabia's tone she could not help feeling the contrast between isabel's half laughing and wholly devoted attitude towards her husband and the dreary dullness of her own relations with charlie she despised him far too much to laugh at him when first i was married isabel continued i used to picture myself as a bold young perseus about to deliver my andromeda of a husband from his monster of a conscience but as the enlightening of early married life went on i realized that paul was rather like those indian people who allow white bulls and white elephants to trample them to death because they worship the animals so now i hang garlands myself round the neck of the creature on its gala days and lie down alongside of my husband while it plays the giddy juggernaut over our prostrate forms believe me my dear a husband with a conscience is no joke yet i can imagine that a husband without a conscience would be still less of one far less that's the difficulty but we have wandered to my beloved husband's conscience while the conversation began about mine i think you said yours was not of the white bull and white elephant species fabia endeavoured once more to stave off what she guessed was coming although she knew that this procrastination would have no effect in the long run isabel might not be as direct in her methods as was old mrs gaythorne but she invariably arrived finally at the point for which she had started not it it is more like the war office or the local government board never interferes until it is too late to mend anything and never locks a stable door until all the horses have died of typhoid a convenient sort of conscience to keep very and very little expense but just now it is so noisy in clamouring for a new lock on the empty stable door that i've no option but to listen to it fabia you are going too often to see that horrid cousin of yours ram chandar mukharji people are talking about it and about you fabia smiled scornfully let them talk but my dear that's just what i don't want to let them do talking is a most hurtful and dangerous practice i do not care what they say about me and ram chandar but you ought to care my dear fabia you really ought already their talking is beginning to do you harm and as for charlie he will go mad when he hears of it as he is bound sooner or later to do even the people whom it most concerns hear of a thing eventually though of course not till long after everybody else i do not care fabia repeated you ought never to have let that tiresome cousin of yours come over from india at all i met him when i was out there years ago and thought him a most weird and uncanny person i am sure charlie wouldn't approve of him as men always hate what is weird and uncanny and different from what they learned at their mother's knees 
paul disapproves most frightfully of anything to do with occultism and spiritualism and things of that kind so i never let him know how intensely they interest me i do not care whether charlie approves of my visits to mount street or not it is no business of his stern disapproval looked out of mrs seaton's blue eyes oh fabia how horrid of you i think it is disgusting to speak of your husband like that why if paul disapproves of anybody it always turns me against them even if i've adored them up to then and if he disapproves of my doing things i never really enjoy doing them even though i have revelled in it before in fact i often refrain from asking him his opinions of things and people for fear he should spoil my pleasure in them for the future again the scornful smile curled fabia's lips if you really loved him as much as you think you do you would obey him in the spirit as well as the letter now fabia don't begin teaching your grandmother how to love her husband because i know a precious sight more about that than you do i may not know much but i do know how a woman feels who is absolutely devoted to her husband and i know that she doesn't feel by any means a fool if you've lost your heart it doesn't follow that you've lost your brain as well still if you lose your heart it frequently follows that you will also lose your head persisted fabia my head isn't of the losing sort thank you i rarely mislay it but generally carry it about with me under my arm a la st winifred so that i can lay my hands on it whenever i think fit well isabel you must admit that your husband's opinion would carry more weight with anybody than my husband's would therefore you cannot wonder at my thinking less of charlie's disapproval than you do of mr seaton's isabel's eye twinkled in a manner which in a less mature and distinguished matron would have been called a wink but i am affected by paul's opinions even when i am aware that he doesn't know what he is talking about and that they aren't worth the breath with which they are uttered that is where the rich joke of being married comes in and yet you say you are not a fool certainly because i know that i am and to be wise enough to know that you are a fool is proof positive that you are not one suddenly fabia's conversation took a desperate turn oh isabel you have no idea how awfully dull it is to be married to a man like charlie i have borne it as long as i can and i don't feel as if i could bear it any longer it is all very well for you who are married to a clever man to preach about the due subjection of a wife but you would sing a different tune if you were married to a well-meaning goose isabel shook her head i don't think so i should never find out that he was a goose if i were in love with him for all i know paul may be one of the dullest men on the face of the earth in fact i know certain people consider him so but to me he is the one supremely interesting fact in the universe the one sufficient and satisfactory entertainment of creation it is far more interesting to me to hear paul say that there is a button off his shirt than to hear the greatest man of the day hold forth upon the most burning questions but that isn't cleverness bless you it's love but i'm not in love with charlie you see i never pretended to be that is where the tragedy of my life comes in if only i loved him then everything would be different it was on the tip of isabel's tongue to say then you ought not to have married him but once more her usually somnolent conscience showed signs of vigour had she not done all in her power to bring about a marriage between fabia and charlie gaythorne and was not a portion of the responsibility of their unhappy union hers fabia went on somewhat pathetically you cannot imagine how horribly dull it is to be married to a man with whom you are not in love you get so deadly tired of his anecdotes i believe that if a woman isn't in love with her husband she could bear anything even his neglect or his downright cruelty better than his anecdotes you didn't object to charlie's anecdotes so much before you married him and i'm sure you heard them all then so you knew exactly what they were about you married with your ears open so to speak i know i did but things sound so different before and after marriage a man may be an amiable pastime but an extremely poor profession he may excel as a recreation but become wearisome as a duty he may prove delightful as an hors d'oeuvre but deadly as a piece de resistance 
fabia you really ought not to discuss your husband with another woman in this fashion said isabel reprovingly then having satisfied her awakening conscience she added what anecdote of charlie's is it that bores you most there are several of them that almost kill me with exhaustion no harm in them you know but as long and pointless as a darning needle and nearly always about his parents so dutiful and yet so dull i think however the story that wearies me most is about mrs gaythorne and a harvest thanksgiving it lasts for ages and always requires a bookmarker i know it replied isabel sympathetically you must if you know charlie well i am now twenty-three years old and charlie twenty-six so we shall in all human probability have about another half-century of each other's society and just think how often during that time i shall hear the story of mrs gaythorne and the harvest thanksgiving it is appalling to contemplate it is like thinking of eternity or climbing up a winding staircase no end and no beginning i suppose however fabio continued that in the most favourable circumstances marriage like politics is the science of the second best and it is absurd to expect the ideal in it not a bit of it retorted isabel with some heat it is either the height of bliss or else the depth of boredom it is the very opposite of the second best as it must be the very best or the very worst a husband is either the one man in the world or else the one man that you wish wasn't in the world there is no happy mean in matrimony well isabel i should have been abundantly satisfied with the second best if only i could have secured it and there was a wistful sound in the sweet voice second best indeed retorted mrs seaton tossing her head and yet i must admit she added with a humorous twinkle that a good many men like their second best fabia agreed with her that is so i fancy that my late respected father-in-law would have been among that number if only he had had the chance paul won't remarked paul's first with much decision in her tone you would hate to think that he could have a second wouldn't you not i replied isabel airily i'm not that selfish dog in the manger sort of a woman i've told paul over and over again that if anything happens to me he is at liberty to marry again as soon as he likes of course he'll find any other woman awfully dull after me but i can't help that he must take the rough with the smooth and the dull with the lively as other men much married have had to do from henry the eighth downwards it is unreasonable of any man to expect to get all his wives cast in the same mould and then having shot her arrow and given her hint isabel wandered off into indifferent subjects she had learnt the great social art of punctuation she knew where to stop and was far too much a woman of the world to indulge in the unpardonable practice known as rubbing it in but in spite of mrs seaton's well-timed word of warning fabia continued to visit the small flat in mount street far oftener than was wise or desirable she was constantly seen going in and out and people talked more than ever in consequence in time the gossip reached the ears of captain gaythorne but he made no sign he was the sort of man who would find it impossible to speak to his wife upon such a subject as this his innate chivalry revolted at the mere idea of such a thing but although he was slow to speak and slow to laugh in his dealings with women he was neither the one nor the other in his dealings with his own sex and he made up his mind that if things continued to go on like this it would not be long before dr mukharji had a very bad quarter of an hour indeed charlie gaythorne might be afraid to scold his wife but he was not at all afraid to give his wife's cousin a sound horse-whipping and he intended to do so at the earliest opportunity isabel finding that her hint to fabia had been of no avail decided with characteristic courage to tackle the occultist himself upon the subject she was still firmly set against speaking to charlie although she knew too much about men to suppose for an instant that they are as blind as they frequently in their mysterious wisdom pretend to be she nevertheless recognized the bare possibility of captain gaythorne's being as ignorant of fabia's goings-on as he appeared and in that case she felt she would rather die than be the instrument employed to open his mercifully closed eyelids therefore having taken the wise and wifely precaution of not mentioning to her husband beforehand what she intended to do lest he should see fit to forbid the same mrs paul seaton joined herself to the multitude of silly women who were being led astray by the false doctrines of dr mukharji and presented herself at the door of the flat in mount street 
she was shown into a waiting-room tastily though scantily furnished and already half full of fashionably dressed women to her profound relief there were none of them who were known to her personally though she knew one or two quite well by sight and as she had added to her toilet a thick motor veil she cherished vain hopes that no one would recognize her it's a good thing that i put on a motor veil like the ostrich and so am invisible she said to herself though i am convinced that some of these horrid old cats will know who i am all the same and talk about it till it gets round to paul but that won't matter as i shall tell him myself at the proper time when it is too late for him to prevent my coming fortunately it is often too late to forbid and never too late to forgive and that is the exact time for making confessions to a husband as mrs seaton had taken the further precaution of making an appointment with dr mukharji she had not long to wait in her ostrich-like invisibility but was shortly ushered by a closely veiled female attendant in gorgeous native dress into the presence of the popular charlatan isabel thought him looking much older than when last she saw him in those far-off pre-nuptial days when she was living with the farleys but that was hardly to be wondered at as she herself had then been in the early dawn of the twenties and now she was fast coming within sight of her fortieth milestone there was no doubt that she did not look as young now as she had looked then but she took the flattering unction to her soul which we all take when we meet friends and acquaintances whom we have not seen for several years namely that though we may have aged a little they have aged much more and there was more ground for isabel's assumption than there frequently is in such circumstances ram chandar had certainly altered more than she in the long years since last they met in the first place he was no longer clean-shaven but a long black beard protected his chest from the inclemencies of the english climate and a beard always ages a man but his dark eyes so like fabia's retained their youthful brilliancy and his hands as small and delicate as a woman's testified as of yore to the highly strong nervous temperament concealed under his manner of apparently immutable calm he had not adopted the good old english custom of measuring the flight of time by the weights of avoir du poids on the contrary he looked if possible slimmer and slighter than he used to do and had lost none of his eastern panther-like grace so you also are among my disciples mrs seaton as i also am among the prophets he said as he advanced to meet his visitor whom he recognized at once in spite of her attempted disguise he was amused at her coming to consult him and he showed it he was fully aware of paul seaton's uncompromising hostility towards everything connected with occultism and the like and anything in the form of wifely insubordination tickled his sense of humour finding her incognito thus ruthlessly thrust aside the ostrich threw back her inadequate disguise somewhat haughtily i have hardly come to ask advice dr mukharji but rather to administer it pray be seated he said in his soft oriental voice placing a chair for mrs seaton i shall not detain you long isabel began and her manner was that of the grande dame which she could assume when she thought it necessary and worth the trouble but i have just one thing to say to you regarding your future no regarding yours the occultist bowed politely i await your instructions mrs seaton it is an agreeable change for me to take the role of learner instead of that of teacher i have come to speak to you dr mukharji about my friend and your cousin mrs charles gaythorne again mukharji bowed an ever interesting subject to me you are doubtless unaware continued isabel more stately than ever that unpleasant remarks are being made about your cousin's too frequent visits to your house i gave her a hint upon the subject but with no avail she is still so young that she hardly realizes how dangerous it is to bring down scandal even upon the most undeserving head but you and i are older than she dr mukharji and we understand how much harm can be done to a woman by ill-natured gossip however unfounded it may be and i therefore come to you to ask you to make some excuse for lessening fabia's visits to you both as regards length and number a mocking smile lit up the dark eyes that were fixed upon isabel i see 
you make an appeal to me to give up the one pleasure of my life at your bidding the one thing that has brought me all the way from india here certainly you have great confidence in your powers of persuasion mrs seaton i congratulate you upon so valuable a possession as unlimited confidence in yourself isabel threw back her head haughtily you mistake me dr mukharji i use no persuasion and i make no appeal i merely point out to you what is required of you as a gentleman and i take it for granted that you cannot disappoint me the mocking eyes still smiled and you do not call that an appeal mrs seaton certainly not it would be an insult to you to do so one can hardly appeal to a gentleman to act as a gentleman since it would be impossible for him to do otherwise the charlatan was far too clever not to recognize and admire cleverness when he saw it and just now his admiration for his visitor was marked the girl whom ram chandar had once condemned as shallow and noisy had developed into an extremely accomplished woman of the world then may i ask precisely what you did come to say to me mrs seaton merely to inform you that malicious gossip is beginning to couple your name with that of your cousin and did you suppose i did not know that already your conduct in allowing her to continue her visits proved conclusively that you did not so you took the trouble to come here in the midst of your busy life to enlighten me an ignorance which had no existence save in your own mind your supposed ignorance did not originate in my mind but in your manner dr mukharji i had no alternative but to believe that you were unconscious that fabia's visits here were doing her harm as otherwise you would have declined to receive her you flatter me mrs seaton if you consider it flattery to take you for a gentleman i do replied the undaunted isabel rising from her seat and now having said what i came to say there is nothing left to say but good morning but the fortune-teller was not going to let her escape so easily stop a minute mrs seaton not so fast now that we have disposed of my cousin fabia's affairs would it not interest you to hear something about your own not at all thank you conscientiously lied isabel if there was one thing that she would have loved more than another it was to have her future foretold by the eastern seer but she knew that her husband profoundly disapproved of all such dabbling in the unseen so she forbore you would not care to know what office mr seaton will hold in the next cabinet or whether he will hold any office at all you are indeed curiously lacking in curiosity isabel was sorely tempted yet she still withstood i will not trespass on your time so far dr mukharji because your husband has forbidden it i see you are indeed a wifely wife mrs seaton isabel did not deign to make any reply to this but she could not fail to feel there was something rather uncanny in the old cultist's knowledge of her inmost thoughts and reasons but do you not think it a pity continued the fortune-teller to allow your husband's narrow views and unfounded prejudices to limit your own mind and intelligence do you not think that in a matter such as this wherein if you will permit me to say so you are far more competent to judge than he is it would be better both for you and for him that you should disobey mr seaton's somewhat unreasonable and arbitrary dictum i neither disobey nor discuss my husband dr mukharji so i can only bid you good morning and isabel swept out of the room with the air of an offended queen as soon as she had gone the occultist laughed aloud to think of a brilliant woman like that subjecting herself and submitting her judgment to a narrow-minded fool such as paul seaton truly a woman in love is a wonderful and remarkable creature isabel at once confessed to her husband where she had been and why and why she had not told him of her visit beforehand she was always candour itself unless there was any very special reason to the contrary as in this case there undoubtedly was for paul would have vetoed her visit to the charlatan at once had he heard of it 
it was not that she was afraid of her husband but that she was afraid of herself not that she felt paul's fiats must not be disobeyed but that she knew it was not in her to disobey them if once they had gone forth it was she not paul who would be really vexed if her obedience to her husband did not come up to her own somewhat elastic standard so she adapted herself to what she considered her own weakness by preventing the commandment from being made until it was already broken a comfortable arrangement for the conscience if not for the commandment paul for his part was immensely amused at the opportunism of his wife though he did not always consider it politic to let that lady know how much amused he was matrimony like experience is a certificated teacher but isabel had reckoned without her host when she treated dr mukharji as an english gentleman he was not an english gentleman and he did not behave as such in spite of isabel's appeal to him fabia's visits to mount street continued with undiminished frequency then at last isabel saw no option but to have recourse to her denier ressort and to speak to charlie gossip was making free with the names of fabia and her cousin and the snowball of scandal increased in size with every rotation as is the way of snowballs and scandals it had proved useless and worse than useless to tackle the principal performers themselves so there was nothing left but to appeal to charlie to save fabia from herself but isabel knew better than to deal with him as she had dealt with the others charlie might not be a genius but he was a gentleman quite as good a thing in its way and better for the persons with whom he had to do there is a wonderful free masonry among really well-bred people they know the rules of the game and are as slow to give or take offence as they are quick to give or take a hint the art of taking a hint is a fine art the art of taking offence a debased one therefore all that isabel did was to remark airily one day in the middle of a conversation with captain gaythorne by the way charlie don't you think that fabia is looking a bit pale and overdone why don't you take her for a run over to paris for whitsuntide the london season is a trying time for unseasoned londoners and fabia is new to the inhalation of wood pavements as yet charlie knew in a minute exactly what she meant and was grateful to her for saying it and for not saying it but all he replied was that's not a bad idea by jove not a bad one at all in fact i call it a ripping good one i should adopt it then if i were you isabel continued i'm sure it would do fabia a lot of good and you wouldn't miss much as there is never anything going on in town at whitsuntide i think this is a trying sort of season the hot weather began so soon and so suddenly april came in like an arctic sea lion and went out like a hot roast lamb a cold in the head tied me by the leg so to speak at easter and we couldn't get away then at all so i proposed to paul to take me for a good long holiday at whitsuntide and i should advise you and fabia to do the same but i thought that those government fellows had to keep their noses to the grindstone don't you know retorted charlie as airily as isabel herself so how will seaton be able to get away on the spree well you see the grindstone won't be turning during the whitsuntide recess so no noses will be required and after that i shall make him find some conservative nose which like charlie's aunt is still running and pair it for another week or so i'll bet you five to one that the whips won't let him off with the present government in such a hole oh they will i know them they won't especially now that the present ministry is in such a bad way that it may smash up at any moment isabel shook her head with her wisest air not it it is feeble and defeat i admit but it is a chronic case not a dangerous one nurses always neglect chronic cases because they are so boring and tiresome and members of parliament do the same thus isabel conveyed to charlie that it was his duty to take his wife out of danger as soon as he could the only possible refuge now being in flight and captain gaythorne thanked her for her solution of the difficulty and decided to adopt it and yet neither of them had mentioned either the nature of the difficulty or the detested name of ram chandar mukharjee end of chapter eighteen
chapter nineteen of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thorny croft fowler chapter nineteen what happened in paris the gaythornes were abroad for the best part of a month and did not come back until the leafy month of june was decidedly passe charlie would have liked to stay away still longer but fabia was so tired of the solitude a deux that she insisted on bringing their stay in paris to a close as they had seen but few people whom she knew and none who amused her it was a noteworthy fact and one which set the tongues of gossip wagging faster than ever that dr mukharji left town when the gaythornes did and did not come back to his flat until after their return thus proving conclusively to all the scandal-mongers interested in the matter that his object in coming to london was not to tell fortunes of ladies in general but to have the spending of fabias in particular not to divulge the futures of his numerous clientele but to destroy that of mrs charles gaythorne on the evening of their return charlie and his wife were dining in their own house in town old mrs gaythorne having foregone a meeting for the abolition of tin fruits among the inhabitants of the cannibal islands in order to sit at meat with her son and daughter-in-law and welcome them back to their native shores when dessert was on the table and the servants had left the room fabia suddenly interrupted the stream of unmemorable conversation which had flowed intermittently during dinner by saying whom do you think we saw in paris mrs gaythorne somebody who had better have stayed at home in a protestant country than gone wandering off among papists and worse than papists mrs gaythorne was very fond of the expression papists and worse than papists but it was a mere figure of speech according to the good lady's ideas the latter class of persons thus indicated were as chimerical as the anthropophagi and the men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders we saw gabriel carr said fabia quietly the bomb shell took full effect mrs gaythorne fairly bounced in her chair i cannot believe it she exclaimed surely you are trifling with me no i am not i only wish for janet's sake that i were charles is this true asked mrs gaythorne turning for confirmation to that son whom she had never known from his childhood to tell a lie yes mother as true as gospel as fabia says i wish to goodness that it wasn't for poor little janet's sake but it is worse luck describe the circumstances was mrs gaythorne's next command tell mother all about it said charlie to his wife you're such a much better hand at reeling off a yarn than i am fabia thus adjured began when we were in paris we often went to the theatre as we found it so very dull in our own sitting-room at the hotel which you ought not to have done her mother-in-law interrupted her mr gaythorne and i never found it dull wherever we were i had my committees as perennial sources of interest and he had me mrs gaythorne when referring to herself always emphasized the personal pronoun as if the other cases as well as the nominative began with a capital letter of course but charlie and i are different replied fabia sweetly as indeed they were 
mr gaythorne wisely allowed his wife to enjoy herself in her own way but unfortunately his son does not follow his example we will leave mr gaythorne for the present and return to gabriel carr where did you see him and what did he say and what excuse did he give for his extraordinary behaviour mrs gaythorne practised to the full the art of keeping to the point well continued fabia one night when we were in a theatre whom should we see in a box opposite to us but gabriel carr at a theatre and a french theatre too and he a clergyman in fact my clergyman i cannot believe it you must have been mistaken but unfortunately we were nothing of the kind said charlie i saw him as plainly as i see you now but he was aged a bit i admit as the sort of life he is leading leaves its mark on a man don't you know i know nothing of the kind fabia proceed with your narrative as charlie says he was aged and he had a worn and dissipated look but we both recognised him in an instant and though he looked older he was just as handsome as ever handsome is as handsome does and therefore i cannot call any man handsome who deserts his wife on his honeymoon and then hides himself behind the scarlet woman in the city of babylon remarked mrs gaythorne not without some reason on her side he didn't behave handsomely i admit but he is a jolly good-looking fellow all the same and always will be said charlie echoing both his wife and his mother as usual but never mind his looks fire away with the story there's a good girl the moment we saw and recognised him i told charlie to go round at once and speak to him and find out what had happened which i did in pretty quick time supplemented captain gaythorne as i was afraid he would cut and run as soon as he recognised us and i wanted to collar him before he'd got the chance was he alone inquired mrs gaythorne charlie looked confused well not exactly alone i mean i can't precisely say that he was alone don't you know then who was accompanying him still charlie stammered and fabia looked on in silent amusement and in mute protest against the unsuccessful old custom of bowdlerizing for the benefit of the in-laws she was sick of her husband's attempt to re-edit her for the perusal of mrs gaythorne and she enjoyed his difficult and futile endeavour to perform a like office on behalf of gabriel carr well mother don't you see i can't exactly it wasn't anybody you'd know don't you know and it hasn't anything to do with the point of the story charles do not prevaricate it is a pernicious habit only one step removed from actual lying tell me at once who was with gabriel carr it was i don't exactly know and i couldn't exactly say don't you know i conclude it was a brother clergyman who had been also led away by ritualism into papistry and you are trying to screen him from me good heavens no it wasn't anybody of that kind i can swear charlie hastened to asseverate while fabia stifled a laugh a new idea replete with horror seized mrs gaythorne was gabriel dressed like a monk i should like to know great scott no mother what questions you do ask he was not even dressed as a parson mrs gaythorne looked mollified i am relieved to hear it i was afraid the poor misguided young man might have been trapped into a monastery but that is enough subterfuge it is no use trying to screen him from me if it was not a romish priest or a monk who was it fabia was enjoying herself immensely and she would have died sooner 
than respond to the constant appealing glances which her husband threw to her for help so she held her peace and let him flounder on well you see mother i don't like to tell you such things and it really isn't any business of ours but it was it was well it was a woman don't you know a nun you don't mean to say he was with a nun almost shrieked mrs gaythorne great scott no far from it charlie ejaculated while fabia who could not stifle her mirth any longer laughed outright again mrs gaythorne looked mollified things after all were not as bad as they might have been then if it was not a nun for which i am devoutly thankful what sort of a woman was it well mother it was it was it was well not quite a proper sort of woman don't you know then at last mrs gaythorne understood oh dear 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 she exclaimed how very very shocking but it must be admitted that the anguish in her voice was less poignant than when she had asked whether it was a monk or a nun in her eyes it was less heinous to offend against the decalogue than against the westminster confession like many another devout christian she was more lenient towards actual sins than towards saintship which took another line from her own gabriel did not see us as soon as we saw him said fabia taking up the thread of her narrative again so charlie went round to his box and knocked at the door it was a pity that i was not there as i should have gone too of course you could not go in the circumstances my dear considering the sort of person that gabriel had with him but a woman of my age can go anywhere and do anything proceed with the narrative charlie must tell now as this is his part of the story charlie as was his wont meekly obeyed well when i knocked at the door carr opened it and didn't recognize me for a second as i'd got my back to the light so i said hello carr i've found you at last i think it's time you gave some account of yourself i didn't speak as strongly as i felt by a long shot as i didn't want a row in the theatre if i'd done as i wanted i should have knocked the fellow down then and there then charles i am thankful that for once you controlled your inclinations it would have distressed me for my son to be involved in a vulgar brawl especially in such a wicked place as paris well mother anyhow i did control myself and that is what makes what happened next all the more rummy the moment i had spoken though i tell you i was as mealy-mouthed as i could induce myself to be when speaking to such a cad carr turned as white as a sheet with such a look of sheer fright in his eyes as i've never seen except on the faces of recruits in their first engagement before the poor beggars had got seasoned to being under fire and then before you could have said knife he dashed past me and ran for his life down the corridor and was out of the building before i knew what he was up to by jove i never saw a fellow in such a blue funk in my life before it was a rummy go altogether mrs gaythorne gasped and then shook her head reprovingly charles you should have stopped him you should not have allowed him to escape before he had given some explanation of his extraordinary conduct and sent some sort of message to janet i tell you mother i couldn't help myself the brute was out of sight before i knew what he was doing if i'd been there i should have stopped him you couldn't mother i swear besides who'd have expected an english gentleman whatever he'd done to turn tail and run away like a frightened skunk there is nothing that i do not expect from misguided persons who are in secret league with the jesuits well anyhow i couldn't stop the beggar and i didn't it was a great pity that i was not with you i should have stopped him and should have insisted upon an explanation then and there 
i did ask the woman who was with him where i could find him continued charley but she refused to tell me anything about him he'd evidently given her his orders that the word was mum as far as he was concerned but i could see that she knew a precious sight more than she chose to tell if i'd been there i should have insisted upon her telling persisted mrs gaythorne who for ever afterwards was rooted and grounded in the belief that had she been present on that memorable occasion much further sorrow and suffering would have been avoided the extreme unlikelihood of her presence in such circumstances considering that nothing would induce her ever to enter either a theatre or a roman catholic country did not seem to occur to her and in some feminine and recondite manner she contrived to lay all the blame of her absence upon her son's devoted shoulders the whole affair upset me most tremendously i can tell you continued charley i always thought carr such a ripping fine fellow a really good chap with no humbug about him but as straight as they make em and then to find him turn out like this well it seems to shake a fellow's belief in everything tears came into mrs gaythorne's eyes and began to course slowly down her weather-beaten cheeks that is what makes any sort of wrong-doing on the part of the clergy so very terrible she said sorrowfully it brings their high calling into disrepute and appears to give the lie to the truths which they have preached but it ought not to do so however sadly his servants may fall away from the holiness of their first estate and may do despite to their sacred profession the master is still the same yesterday to-day and for ever with him there is no variableness neither shadow of turning never forget that my son charley was touched and therefore shy and uncomfortable of course not mother of course not i shouldn't think of doing such a thing besides he added boyishly those of us who have good mothers don't want any parson to teach us about things the parsons may fail us but our mothers won't and we shan't go far wrong if we take our mother's love as a sort of sample of what god's love is like and depend on it just the same don't you know fabia was interested and puzzled what a strange and wonderful thing this christian religion was mrs gaythorne as a rule was a martha rather than a mary and busied herself with the practical side more than the spiritual side of religion but just now there was a look in her face which must compel awe and reverence in all who beheld it bobby had seen the same look in gabriel carr's face in london and at vernacre though not a trace of it in the parisian theatre she called it illumination and inspiration for want of a better name had she been brought up in the same school as mrs gaythorne she would have called it the indwelling of the spirit the three gaythornes talked over with one another the problem of gabriel and on the following day went and talked it all over again with the setons but they could none of them arrive at any satisfactory conclusion or see that anything more could be done after the encounter at the theatre captain gaythorne had explored paris for further traces of gabriel but in vain the latter had evidently taken fright at charley's recognition of him and had once again disappeared searching for him in paris was like looking in a bundle of hay for a needle endowed with the power of evading pursuit so as there was nothing further to be done they all agreed to do it then fabia did about the worst thing that she had ever done in her life it might not be as foolish as were her repeated visits to the flat in mount street but it was more evil in its essence since it was intended to do harm while the visits to mount street were only organized pour passer le temps and like the worst things that are done by the majority of us it had its origin in jealousy she went down for the day to gaythorne and told the full and complete history of the scene in paris to janet carr 
fabia was not only jealous because gabriel had rejected her and chosen janet although in spite of all that had happened she still hated her on that score the cause of the hatred might be over but the hatred itself remained since hate like love has a wonderful power of surviving its instigators her own love for gabriel had died a sudden death on that night in paris just at first when she saw him in the opposite box the sight of the man's physical beauty stirred the embers of her love into flames again she was always particularly sensitive to the influence of beauty but when she beheld across the theatre the pitiable exhibition of craven fear which the appearance of her husband produced her love was turned into loathing and contempt if there was one thing that she adored more than beauty it was strength strength as shown by physical courage for fabia was too elemental a woman to feel the fascination of moral excellencies and as she had first loved gabriel when he showed himself her master so she ceased to love him as soon as she believed him to be in terror of her husband but fabia had still further cause of jealousy of janet for in spite of all her sorrow and misery the supreme joy of motherhood was about to crown poor janet's life and to give her beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness and again fabia's nature was too elemental for her not to be jealous of every woman to whom had been granted the happiness which she had hitherto been denied the culminating happiness of motherhood we shall all do well to remember that the unclean spirit which seeketh rest and findeth none and so returneth to the house whence he came taking with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself is nearly always the spirit of jealousy among all the evil demons there is none so clever as he in paving the way for his comrades and in opening doors for the ingress which but for him would have remained closed to them for ever so it came to pass that fabia went down to gaythorne on purpose to retail the miserable parisian episode to gabriel's wife janet heard her to the end with no sign of emotion save a somewhat heightened colour then when the wretched story was finished she quietly asked and why have you told me this mrs gaythorne because i thought you ought to know it fabia replied she had indeed managed to persuade herself that it was wrong to keep a person so deeply concerned in the matter as was janet in the dark with regard to the kind of life which her husband was apparently leading and that therefore it was the duty of janet's friends to enlighten her upon the point so specious are the arguments of the spirit of jealousy why janet never wasted words fabia was somewhat nonplussed oh because you are mr carr's wife and therefore his conduct affects you more than anybody else she lamely explained that was rather a reason for not telling me was the quiet reply fabia was silent for a moment she found the calm scorn in the hazel eyes decidedly uncomfortable then she said i should imagine now that you know what manner of man your husband is you will leave off hoping or even wishing for his return the hazel eyes flashed at last and you expect me to believe this tale you have come to tell me i fail to see how you can help believing it my husband is quite prepared to corroborate my statement that we both saw mr carr with our own eyes and although you may not think much of my accuracy everybody knows that captain gaythorne is a painfully truthful person and given that it is true what difference will that make what difference i do not know what you mean fabia gasped with astonishment it would have made all the difference in the world to her had she been in janet's place 
then the pent-up storm of janet's wrath broke i don't believe that what you tell me is true i can't believe it but even supposing that it were what is that to me does it make gabriel any the less my husband wherever he is and whatever he had done i am still his wife and he is my lord and master nothing can alter that i belong to him body and soul to do with as he pleases whenever he comes back he will find me waiting to welcome him home as if nothing had happened fabia was aghast i am at a loss to understand you she murmured janet laughed in her scorn you understand me of course you can you who never loved anybody in the world but yourself how can you understand the mysterious unity of marriage gabriel and i are indissolubly one whatever happens nothing can put us asunder and even if it is true that he has sinned and suffered then he will need me more than he did when he was one of the saints of god and he will find me all the more ready to comfort and cherish him when he comes to himself do you remember the story of st anne who after her husband had been stoned out of the synagogue received him with more love and reverence than she had ever shown him before and do you think that there are no st anne's to-day not perhaps of your world or in your circle but they exist all the same doubtless you will find plenty of people ready to help you in casting stones at my husband when he does come back but from me whom he has most wronged if he has wronged anybody he shall never hear a word of reproach but only words of love and of welcome and janet in the dignity of her outraged love flung back her head with such a queenly gesture that fabia stood before her cowed as she had once stood before janet's husband she said good-bye and got herself out of the room as best she could feeling for a second time in her life like a beaten cur and from that moment she liked and respected janet carr and felt that she would give the half of all that she possessed if only she could love any one as janet loved gabriel it is loving not being loved that makes a woman as a king's daughter all glorious within and clothes her spirit as with wrought gold in the kingdom of heaven they who love will always take precedence of them who only are beloved for with regard to spiritual as well as to material gifts it is ever more blessed to give than to receive End of chapter nineteen